Let's talk about the power of cities because the world is rapidly urbanizing. What you see right here is a city of Shenzhen in southern China, just north of Hong Kong. In 1979, it was a population of 30,000, a fishing community. Today, it's a mega city of 10 million people. The UN predicts that by 2050, the world will grow by a third of the population, from 7 billion to 9.2 billion. China will remain the same at 1.4 billion because of their one-child policy. But India will continue to grow at 33% and be the largest, most populous country in the world in 1950 at 1.6 billion. But look at the United States. We're also growing by one-third, from 300 million to 400 million, unique among the Western democracies, most of which will either be stable or lose population. That population growth was being fueled by an unprecedented migration from rural to urban areas. In 1910, you can see 10% of the population lived in cities and urban areas. By, 20, by 2008, we'd reached that magical point when 50% of people were living in urbanized areas. And of course, by 2050, it'll be 75%. And that includes China and India, which are now primarily rural communities. The United States is 82% urban right now, will be 84% in 2050. Unfortunately, that growth in population, that unprecedented migration from rural to urban, has created megacities like Mumbai here in India. 20 million people now, be 36 million people in 2050, but 40% of the people in Mumbai live in slums like this. That's 8 million people with very little or no access to electricity, sanitary facilities, or fresh water. And it's not just urban India. It's rural India. This is North India, where people walk from their villages to this open well, pull up water, put it in water jars, and head back. The National Geographic last April put out a special issue, Water, Our Thirsty World. If you don't have it, try to get hold of it. A few factoids. 2.5% of the water in the world is fresh. The rest is salt water. Two-thirds of that fresh water is frozen in the polar ice caps and in the glaciers. And it's not evenly distributed over the world, as we've seen. And remarkably, 20% of the surface fresh water in the world is right here, in the Great Lakes and the watersheds of the upper Midwest. Deepak Jain, a professor at Northwestern University, has been studying the water issue for a long time. And he claims that water is going to be more important than oil in 20 years. And it's not just about this little boy walking from that well across parched earth to his village. It's also about Lake Mead outside of Las Vegas behind the Hoover Dam, its lowest level ever. ever. And Las Vegas is in water crisis right now, not only because of Lake Mead, but they're, they're dangerously drawing down water from their aquifer, the Owens Aquifer, under the city. The Natural Resources Defense Council predicts that by 2050, one-third of the counties in our United States, primarily in the Sun Belt, will be in severe water risk. So what does this mean about Pittsburgh in the global water crisis, global population growth? Well, we certainly have a lot of water, but we're not growing. What we are doing is sprawling and spreading out. This is the six counties of southwestern Pennsylvania, the red areas of the urbanized areas. On the left, you'll see in, 20, in, in 1950, we had a regional population of 2.4 million. Now, here today, we have a regional population of 2.4 million. But we're consuming three to four times as much land to do that. Now, we are a post-industrial city, and we've gone through all the problems of losing our basic industry and retooling and revitalizing. And we've done a very good job of it. But the stigma still remains, a post-industrial city. And we get labeled, not only us, but Buffalo and Cleveland and you name it, with these pejorative labels and terms such as shrinking city, frost belt city, and the one I hate most of all, rust belt city. And we're not like this anymore with darkness at noon in downtown Pittsburgh. We're a green city. We're a sustainable city. We're not rusting. We're not dead. 
These post-industrial cities are national treasures, shouldn't be cast aside like the ghost towns of the Old West. The strengths of post-industrial cities. We have authenticity and heritage, walkable neighborhoods with transit, universities and medical centers, cultural and recreational amenities way beyond our means, and abundant fresh water. Here's a beautiful walkable neighborhood on the north side of Pittsburgh. And then here's the economic engine of the region, Carnegie Mellon University in Oakland, University of Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And this is a great treasure. But people still say, if only we had more people. As if size was the problem. But size is not the problem. The region of Pittsburgh is larger as large or larger than 75% of the metropolitan regions in all of Europe. Here are just a few of them. Copenhagen, Zurich, Vienna, Turin, Dublin. It's hard to imagine that people in Dublin think that their town is too small, their region is too small to be a complete city with a great quality of life. So size isn't, to, isn't the issue, but I don't think population growth is the issue either. Let's look at two metropolitan areas, Pittsburgh and Phoenix. As we already saw, 2.4 million was the magic thing for Pittsburgh, the region in 1950, the region today. Our, our city went from seven, 677,000 to 305. But look at Phoenix, 105,000 to a million six in the city. But the region grew 12 times from 350,000 to 4,300,000. ,000. So this leads to that popular formula about population growth. The Rust Belt equals bad and the Sun Belt equals good, but not so fast. Paul Gottlieb, who's an economist, wrote a, a very uh, important paper for the Brookings Institution called Growth Without Growth. He predicts and concludes that growth in per capita income is more important than population growth. And he characterized cities in various ways, two of which were population magnets and the other's wealth builders. So population magnets, not surprisingly, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Orlando, but they are characterized as low density, auto dependent, undiversified economies, and the population growth was caused by the growth industry itself, which is home building and road building. That's not sustainable, it's illusory, and as the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009 proved, it's not workable. Most people were very surprised to find that the top three wealth builders in the United States were St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and Milwaukee. And he characterized them as technology, rich, stable, diversified economies fueled by legacy, educational, medical, and philanthropic institutions. So here is population magnet Phoenix importing ever scarce water from the Colorado River, irrigating the Sonoma Desert, sprawling in all directions, and an economic freefall. And here is Pittsburgh, wealth builder, water rich, reinventing the post-industrial city. And so a new terminology is needed. The Sun Belt <laughs> becomes the Drought Belt, and the Rust Belt becomes the Water Belt. And so this is the power of the post-industrial city. Thank you. Thank you.